Did your ancestor leave a will choosing who they wanted to inherit all of their property after they died? Have you taken a close look at that will and squeezed out every last clue it gives? Let's take a look at one line by line right now. Hey, I'm Melissa Finley. Welcome to Boundless Genealogy, where I help you dig deeper into the documents you find in your family history search to squeeze out every last clue that helps you expand your family tree with more precision and skill. I'd love to have you join me for every episode, so please subscribe. When a person dies, all of the property that they own needs to be disposed of or given to the people that are going to inherit it. A person could choose how their property was going to be disposed of by writing a will, sometimes called a last will and testament, describing exactly how they wanted their property disposed of. You can find digital wills on most major genealogical research sites. Although a small number of them are searchable, you might have to go and scroll through a digital microfilm to find if your ancestor is in the will books for the county where they died. Today's will example is from a man named Archibald Miller who died in the 1870s in Georgia. Before we jump into the details of this will, let's discuss the general way that wills were written during this time period across much of the United States. The testator or person writing the will would usually state their name, their place of residence, and the reason that you can believe that this is their last will and testament. So for example, that they are of sound mind or that they're aging but still capable, etc. They give you a reason to know that this will is valid and their actual desires. Next, they typically revoke any previous wills that may have been written. Then typically, they give instruction for how they would like their body to be disposed of. Lastly, in this beginning section of a will, the person writing the will would typically say that they want all of their debts to be paid out of their property first before anything is given to heirs. This section of the will, the first section, is typically pretty standard and it's called boilerplate. Boilerplate means that if you look at a will during this time period in the United States, you will generally find the same pattern and information that starts a will. However, that doesn't mean we shouldn't look closely at it in case there's any additional clues or information included there, but that is typically the order that you can expect in a will. Now, there are other portions of a will that could also be considered boilerplate, and I will point those out as we go through this example. After the first section of boilerplate, the testator or will writer will start to go item by item for their wishes and desires of how to distribute their remaining property to their heirs. In Archibald's case, he begins in item three by giving the majority of his property to his beloved wife, Hannah. And interestingly in this will, this is not typical, but it's pretty cool. He says, with whom I have lived in the strictest quick for 52 years. I love that. It gives us a lot of information right there that they have been married for 52 years. Next item four, he gives uh, property to his daughter, Margaret Manny, widow. Item five, to his daughter, Susan Davis, also a widow, and her son, Daniel Davis. Item six. Item six is kind of lengthy. It has a long explanation, but it is some property he's giving to his son, Empson W. Miller. Item seven is to his daughter, Jane Terry, wife of William C. Terry and all her children. Item eight is for his son, Bayless B. Miller. And then item nine is to his daughter, Harriet, single and unmarried. Each of these items gives a little bit of information about each of these people from his family, which is great. In item 10, he is giving property to his son, Daniel H. Miller. In item 11, he is giving all of his personal property to his wife, Hannah. So in the third item, which is the first item where he's giving um, property inheritance to his heirs, 
he gives Hannah real estate property, so, you know, land, house, etc. But in item 11, he's giving her all of his personal property. So all of the belongings in the house, such as furniture and animals, etc. After that, we come back to a section of boilerplate where he will state the person who is supposed to carry out his wishes and execute his will. This is the executor, and he names a friend, N.J. Boazo, as his executor, or the person who will legally be responsible to carry out his final wishes. And he dates it and he signs it. In this case, he signs with an X for his mark, meaning that he could not sign his name. Next, it's another part of the boilerplate. It says, signed, sealed, and declared and published by Archibald Miller as his last will and testament in the presence of some witnesses. So this part is pretty typical. It will say, we were here witnessing this man, in this case, Archibald Miller, writing and signing his last will and testament. He did it of his own free will. It was his desires. And then they also date and sign. In this case, he had three witnesses, and that's pretty typical. Well, this will is already long. It's already expanded two pages of the court papers, but it actually goes on. The next section says codicil or codicil. Codicil is more British. Codicil is more American English. What is a codicil, first of all? A codicil is an amendment. So he wrote his will, in this case in 1872, and he's coming back later and saying, I need to make some adjustments to the will. Either I forgot someone, something or someone, you know, made me mad and I take them off or something. Something's happened, you know, and it's just his way of saying, I'm not revoking my entire previous will. I'm just going to make some addendums and some changes to it. So an interesting thing to note, the first part of the will was written in Gordon County. So that would have been his residence at the time uh, that he wrote the will in 1872. But this codicil says it was written in Bartow County, Georgia. So he has moved by the time he writes his codicil. He starts again with some boilerplate. This is my name, I wrote a will before, and this is just changing a few items. Oh, and he also, um, as part of the boilerplate proving who he is and his previous will, he also writes the names of the witnesses that witnessed the first will. Now he says, I am going to change items seven, nine, and 10 from the first original will. And here's how I want those carried out. Um, and then he goes through item by item, revoking those previous articles and then stating what he, what he wants to happen instead. And he goes on and there's six items there of uh, first revoking the three previous items from the previous will and then adding a few new ones as well. And then at the very end, and the boilerplate, just like the first will, comes back up again. He signs it, he dates it, and then he has three new witnesses in this case, also uh, witness that they saw him sign it. It is his will and they are signing their names as the witnesses. At the end here, we get some interesting dates. So his uh, codicil was signed on February 12th, 1874. And then the will itself was brought in and filed at the court office on June the 4th, 1878. So it's pretty safe to say that Archibald Miller died sometime shortly before June the 4th, 1878 because his executor and his family would have been anxious to get that record, uh, excuse me, his will in and proved in the court so that all of the financial transactions could be settled and transferred and they could carry on with their property. And then it was finally recorded on February the 19th of 1879 in the court of the ordinary, the ordinary court of Bartow County, Georgia. So let's go over the clue web for Archibald Miller. We get a lot of clues out of this awesome will. 
we get that he was married to Hannah for 52 years as of 1872. So they were married around 1820. We get several children, son Emson and Daniel, and also son Bayless, and then daughters Jane, Harriet, Susan, and Margaret. And several of those daughters include their married surnames, which is very helpful to find more information about those daughters. In one case, a specific child is even named um, and a specific husband for two of the daughters, which is very helpful for finding more information about those daughters. We also get, uh, if you read in detail, I didn't go over in detail of each item, but as you read through each item about each child, it's very interesting. It gives a lot of um, familial relationship details about Archibald and each of his children. In several cases, he's saying, I bequeath to them this certain dollar amount, which they have already enjoyed because I've already lent it to them, and they and their wife and their children have enjoyed it. And then with his daughter, Harriet, he lists her as single and unmarried. And then he goes on to say, faithful, affectionate, valuable daughter. And he bequeaths her much of his property. And also says that the personal property after the death of his wife should all go to Harriet as well. So apparently she is the, the single daughter that is staying at home and caring for her parents. And he really appreciates that. Even though we don't have a specific death date for Archibald, we can assume that he died shortly before the 4th of June, 1878, when the will was filed in court. And of course, between the will itself and the codicil, we get two different places of residence for Archibald Miller, which would help us find other records for his life in those places. Let's talk about what else this record gives us. Let's kind of shrink down his family uh, and dates, clue web. This will and codicil are actually really rich in giving us some associates for Archibald. We get eight different men listed who are his associates. In one case, it's someone who owes him money, owes Archibald money, and that he says, if he hasn't paid me back by the time I die, he owes that money to my wife and he better pay up. Um, he has N.J. Boazo or Boaz that is listed as his good and faithful friend who is the one chosen to be the executor of his will. And then we have six men who were chosen as his witnesses. So this helps us as we dig more into his life, we get a lot more context of who he is interacting with in the different counties and who were his friends and associates and maybe those who like to borrow money from him too. All right, before we end today, let's talk about uh, some assumptions that we need to be careful about making when we're looking at wills. First of all, keep in mind that even though this particular will lists many of Archibald's children, this might not be the complete set of his children. That's the same in any will you're going to be looking at. Um, he might have left some out purposefully because he did not want to leave any property to them. Um, maybe some of his children had already died before and he was not going to list deceased children in his will. Um, in this case, he did list his children, even though he had previously given them a portion of their inheritance. But in some cases, men would choose to completely leave out children that they had previously given property or money to, and they would just um, list the children that had not yet received their inheritance and needed to receive it in the future. Other times, a man might choose to list only the inheritances for the children that are still at home, things he would like to have them inherit once they come of age, and he would just uh, give property to his other children before he passed away of the adult children. So sometimes that's the case. So just be careful to not make assumptions that the children listed in the will are the only children. That is not necessarily the case. Next, keep in mind that a wife named in a will might not be the mother of the children named in the will. She is likely the wife that is there with him at the end of his life, but he perhaps had previous wife or wives that have died that were at the uh, mother of his children. So be cautious about making assumptions about that. In this case, because he said, that he had lived faithfully with his wife for 52 years. That helped us to know uh, their approximate marriage date and really could help us to identify any of the children that were 
under the age of 52 are likely the children of that particular mother, Hannah, that's listed in this will. But unless your will specifically lists that, you need to be careful and find other records to find out uh, which wife this is and which children belong to her. So what are some of the questions that this will leaves us with? It makes me wonder, how did Archibald obtain his wealth? It's interesting that he did have a lot of property and wealth to give to his children, uh, but he did not sign his own name. He only signed with an X. So that's an interesting juxtaposition to me. Why did he move counties then at the end of his life? Why did he move from Gordon County to Bartow County, Georgia? They are just right next door to each other, uh, north and south of each other. Another question that springs up is what is Hannah's maiden name? Now, it is not common for a man to list his wife's maiden name in a will, but when I see a woman named only with her first name, I always just wonder, ah, oh, couldn't you just give us the maiden name? That'd be so nice. And then I, I am curious about his connection with those eight additional associates he listed in his will and his codicil, the one who owed him money, the one he chose as his executor, and the others who acted as witnesses. What was their relationship? Were they business partners? Were they friends? Were they neighbors? Um, were they distant relatives? Because that's a very distinct possibility as well. And that always makes me curious. Where else could this will lead us as far as records about Archibald, but also about all of the other family members he lists in his will? This can lead us to the other records that very likely exist in the probate case for his will, because uh, not only would he have, they have proven the will in court, but then they would have to take an inventory of all of his property and goods. And then they would have to prove out that all of those goods were distributed correctly, that all of his debts were paid, and all of those records should also be in the probate court. It also leads us to land records in both counties because he is giving land to his wife and children in both Gordon and Bartow County. This can lead us to some census records for his family. It should be quite easy to identify them in the censuses before his will because he's listed all of his children. And then it gives us information about that would lead us to the marriage records for his children, especially his daughters. Although he does list uh, when his sons have a wife, he does list them as wife and children in the will. So we could go look up the marriages of his children. Then we could try and find death information for the husbands of the two daughters that were listed as widowed by the time of the 1872 will. And then another detail that's written with his son, um, Daniel H. Miller, when he's bequeathing property to him, is that he, that Archibald paid for some college expenses for Daniel, and that is part of his inheritance that he already paid his college. It'd be interesting to try and find the college records for Daniel and learn more about his college experience. A will can give us so many clues to help us expand our family tree. Information about family relationships, wealth, residences. It can also help us pinpoint a death date when vital records might not have been kept in that area during that time period. If you already have a will or two in your genealogy collection, I encourage you to pull those out and look through the details again and see if you missed any clues the first time around. You might be surprised at what's there. If you haven't found a will for your ancestor yet, just know that not every person left a will, but it's worth a look to see if they did because sometimes they can be treasure troves of amazing genealogical information. I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. All right. Kids are popping popcorn and airplanes are flying over, but I think we'll be okay to go in a minute. Now some neighbor's big old truck is going too. <laughs>